Hi, this is Zach from Mercury Works, and I am going to show you today how to shoot 65 millimeter film, the same kind of film used for IMAX in cinemas on your Mamiya RB67, RZ67, or Mamiya Press Universal camera. It is actually quite easy to do and produces amazing results. You're basically shooting IMAX cinema as a still photographer. Okay, so the format is this. You're going to be shooting six by seven images in, in most of these cases. And you're going to be doing it with this back. This is the RB67 70 millimeter film holder. And you're going to be shooting with this film. This is Kodak film that has been re-spooled for photographers by Mercury Works. And it comes in a, these, these bulk cans that are in either 50 feet or 100 foot lengths on, spe on Kodak, well, special reels, special bulk reels that, that we create, but that are compatible with and um, 70 millimeter bulk reel, so they can go in any 70 millimeter bulk loader, the Alden loader or the Mercury bulk loader. And you will load your film into this. These are metal 70 millimeter cassettes. And the way these work, they're basically uh, an enlarged version of 135 or 35 millimeter film cassettes. They're just a higher quality, reusable, large version designed for 70 millimeter film. And the way they work is they have caps on either end that are meant to just pop off. You can take off either end and inside is a spool. And what you do is you load your own cassettes. And you can do this with a Alden loader, 70 millimeter bulk loader, or way more accessibly and inexpensively and easier and with less chance of scratching your film, a Mercury Works bulk loader. And the bulk loader takes film from a can like these and allows you to load as much as you want onto a spool cassette. I mean, uh, a cassette spool. And then that goes inside one of these cassettes. And you snap it closed. And this is what you load into your back. So these are fantastic. They protect your film. They're daylight spool. So one, you, have to spool, you have to load them in the dark. But once you've loaded them, you can load the camera in the light. And uh, as you'll see, this is, acts as both a feed spool and then another one acts as a, as a take up spool. So your film is only briefly exposed um, to anything. It's protected the rest of the time by something much, much, much better than let's say 120 backing paper or something like that. This protects your film from just about anything, any amount of light, et cetera, um, and even protects it from x-rays. So at any rate, you're going to get this film in these cans of 50 feet or 100 feet uh, by Mercury Works, and then you and, and then you load those can that that onto the cassette. Now, the only difference here between 70 millimeter and 65 millimeter film is the spool inside the can. So, this you, I showed you the standard 70 millimeter spool. This is a Mercury Works 65 millimeter spool, and these come in different varieties. There's a centered variety, and there's an offset variety, and some others. For our purposes, most of the time, you're going to be using an offset spool when shooting with any of those three Mamiya 6x7 cameras. In another video, I show you how to actually load your film into a cassette. So refer to that video, how to load a bulk cassette. Um, 
with either 70 millimeter or 65 millimeter film. Uh, look at that other video for those instructions. But once you're done with that, this is what you'll have. Now I'll say right up front, the amazing thing here is that you can choose how much film to load onto your cassette. If you want to load three exposures onto your cassette and shoot that, you can do that. If you want to load the equivalent of a 120 length of film, you can do that. If you want to load the equivalent of a 220 length of film, you can do that. And Mercury Works makes developing spools for Jobo and for Patterson uh, that can hold up to a 220 length of 65 millimeter film. So that's a popular length to load because it's easy to develop yourself. But you can also load more um, and you can send this off to M Alchemy to have it developed. So the key here is you choose how much to load on the cassette and as we'll talk about later, you can also choose when to cut your film uh, to develop. You do not have to finish your roll to develop your film, unlike with, roll, with 120 roll film. So this is an enormous advantage, two huge advantages right there about for, nine, for 65 millimeter film over 120 film is that you can load whatever size roll you want that makes sense for you and you can, uh, you don't have to finish your roll in order to develop it. It can be e very easily snipped and uh, cut at any point. It's designed to do that. It's the point of this in seven, original 70 millimeter system is it's a professional system as opposed to 120 which is an uh, meant to be an amateur system um, and so it gives you far far more control over what you do and of course you can shoot much larger rolls if you if that if you want to one of these cassettes can hold up to 13 feet of 65 millimeter film and that is the equivalent of about five rolls of 120 film so you can load an enormous amount in one roll if you want to shoot a lot or if you just want to shoot however much you want to shoot and then cut and develop that amount. Okay, so let's get on to it. Instead of uh, the difference here is that because 65 millimeter film is five millimeters uh, narrower than 70 millimeter film, it goes on the special spool and it comes out if you use the offset variety and again, I'll talk about that in a moment, but if you're using your own back, not one modified by Mercury Works, you will need to use an offset spool, which will put your film uh, a couple millimeters offset uh, from center. Um, and I'll show you why in a moment. But if you're using a, um, a Mercury back, you can, do, you can use a centered 65 millimeter spool. But either way, when you're done, you'll have 65 millimeter film poking out the end of your cassette. And if it's, if it, it'll either be centered or offset, depending on the type of spool, this, this is an offset here, uh, ready, ready to shoot. So this is what you kind of keep at the ready in, uh, to load into your back. So now let's take a look at the back itself. This is the RB67 70 millimeter film holder. It's a lot like a 120 or 220 uh, roll film back for the RB67, but it's fatter. It's larger, it, it's a little bit deeper, and it's a little bit wider, and it's a little bit taller because it holds two of these cassettes. Inside the back, you have pretty classic insert and a shell. And the insert has right here a wheel and a little sprocket wheel that's built into the, mecha the mechanism of the back. And the way this works is that is what uh, turns when as you wind film and as it turns it locks your film, it, it, it controls your frame spacing. Now the problem here is that originally this sprocket is designed for 70 millimeter film type two perforations only. So this is already a problem because there's very little type two 70 millimeter film around. Um, their older film is type one perforations and 
A lot of 70 millimeter film is unperforated and 65 millimeter film, even though it has perforations, uh, what we want to do is treat this, treat it as unperforated for the purposes of shooting it in this back. So what that means is we need to modify this back so that it can accept all perforations of film. And that's an enormously important upgrade anyway because it allows you to shoot all of those films. It can shoot any kind of film, including the standard type two perforations, but it's necessary in order to shoot 65 millimeter IMAX film. So to do that, here's how, uh, I'm not gonna show you, I'm not gonna actually do it, but our, we have written, our written instructions uh, on how to modify the back, and I'll show you very briefly what it entails. It's not difficult to do, um, but for some it might be, you do have to permanently modify the back. And this is what you do. You do not remove this sprocket wheel because the sprocket wheel is compression fit into the shaft that's in, in the gearing. If you, so trust me, you don't want to try to remove that because what'll happen is you'll damage the, 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 the gearing in the back. So instead what you do, first of all, you take the, this bottom uh, part off and you do that by turning this to the little red dot and popping it off. Uh, we're gonna look at that later anyway. But in here, what you have to do is actually grind down and off the little sprockets on this wheel. And you can do that with a file. You can hold this steady and, and bring a little diamond file and file off these um, patiently. Uh, much faster, you can do it with a Dremel um, and, uh, and a cutoff wheel. And what you do is you just run it in very, very carefully along, and one at a time you take the little, these little uh, sprockets and kind of very carefully, this is made out of aluminum, by the way. This, is, uh, this wheel is, is anodized aluminum, so it is metal. Um, and you have to, you just kind of grind off the little, the little uh, sprocket. When you do that, ideally you need to make a little bit of an indent. You don't want to, you, you want to leave a little bit of the top and bottom of the wheel because you're leaving a little lip because what we're going to do is put a rubber, a kind of elastic band uh, in there. And it's nice if you can create a little, tiny, barely, a little groove for it to ride in. But at the very least, you need to completely remove each sprocket. It cannot be a bump st um, sticking up higher than the surface of the wheel itself. So you do that, you go around and do that for every single one. And when you're done with that, what you do is you're on the bottom of the back are two screws. You remove those screws, which allows this piece to remove uh, and and this retaining piece of metal, which will allow this, the roller, to slide off. And when it slides off, only the sprocket wheel will be left. And what you do is you take one of these. This is a dental elastic, right? So this is synthetic, synthetic, like a rubber, like, like it's like a rubber band, but it's not made out of rubber and it won't deteriorate like a rubber band will. Um, and you, you, it's a dental elastic, quarter, uh, quarter inch size. And for bra they're basically for braces and retainers and, and that kind of thing. So at this point, you just string it on there and, and, and stretch it over and into the little groove that you cut uh, when you removed these, the, the, the little sprockets on the, on the wheel. And that's all you do. What I'm going to do now is switch over to a back that has already been modified. Let's take a look at that. You can see in here, maybe, that it, is, it now turns on the basis of friction instead of needing uh, perforations to turn it. And it turns very easily, and any film will turn it, whether it's perforated or not perforated. So that's what you'll end up with. It is actually a, a very important upgrade for this back. I'd recommend it no matter what, even if you don't shoot 65 millimeter film, though why would you not do that? If you owned this back. All right, once you have a properly all perf modified back, you can't, you're ready to shoot. Well, you're ready to load. So here's what we do. To load this, you open this up, you open up the shell, 
pop out the insert and then you need to take off the bottom and you just turn that this little thing to the so that the red dot it's touching the red dot and then this whole thing pops off and this is what you're left with and Mamiya gives you a really nice little diagram that shows the way to load the back this is your feed side you take your your uh, cassette loaded cassette stick it in there and again you needed to load this cassette with if you're using 65 millimeter film and um, a, you can sometimes get away with a center a center spool but the film will make a little bit less contact with the wheel now with a mercury back that's not a problem because you have a backup and you can always uh, advance the film even if that wheel is not turning but with a stock back uh, you're, you're going to want a, an offset spool, and when you load it, you load it so that the film is on this side of the offset spool. So, so it's on the top of the back with a little extra gap here on the bottom. So this just goes in there, and what you do is just pull out some film. You can use a Mercury 65 millimeter cassette uh, um, splicer if you want to add leader and if you add leader you can use the same leader on every roll and then you won't waste any film here at the beginning but otherwise use just use a little bit of film to act as your leader and you do this in the daylight well i would do it in subdued light but you can do it in light you want to be able to see what you're doing now we can you can look at the at the diagram and realize it has to come in the bottom and circle around this way it would not come in and circle this way uh, but as long as you follow the diagram, you'll be okay. So we're following the diagram, and now we need to add a second spool, which is our take-up spool. Again, it needs to match the first spool, so it's either a centered 65 millimeter spool or an offset. This is an offset. Because we're using an offset here, we're going to use an offset on this side. And remember, the film is going to come around this way, according to the diagram. And now you have a choice. Original the 70 millimeter spools come with this little metal uh, retaining clip. You can, th these 65 millimeter spools are compatible with that retaining clip. So you can take, you can roll this around and snap this clip onto your spool. But I don't trust these. 65 millimeter film is quite thick. It's a professional film. It's thick and it's springy as a result. And it's possible to turn. Sometimes this isn't just, just doesn't grip enough. So what I do and what I recommend is you use a little cut piece of or torn piece of painter's tape, blue painter's tape. And you don't need to use this little retaining clip, or though you could even you know do both as, as here, but you you take your blue painter's tape, roll it around so that it connects to it. You just tape it onto your, the edge of your spool. Now, what I recommend doing here, now this needs to go into a cassette. And what you need to do is make sure that the cassette is oriented correctly for the feeding of the film. And again, you can look at the diagram. This is going to go around like this. And the cassette, in the diagram, you notice when you look at these cassettes, there's one side that where the two where it meets in a corner, where these two straight edges meet in a corner, and then there's a little lip that sticks out of one of them. One straight edge kind of has nothing. The other straight edge has this little lip here that sticks out. The film always loads in the direction of that lip. So if you're feeding, the, feed will fil the film will feed like this, uh, out the straight edge through that lip. If, you're, if, you're, uh, if it's a take-up spool and you're, you're feeding into the spool, it's the same thing. It will go through that little lip and into and spool like that. So you need to make sure the lip is correct. If you did this, for instance, the, the lip is in the wrong place. And you can see that even in the diagram, right, where they show you that little lip. So that you need to, 
if you put it in like that, it would be wrong. You need to flip it, and you're going to put it in like that so that that lip is coming out here in the direction shown, in the orientation shown in that image. That's what you're going to end up with. To get there, you, what you need to do is you hold this basically in the orientation you know you need, and then you have your film in the orientation you know it needs to, to go, and then depending on what end, you, you just fit the two together. So in this case, I'm going without changing their orientation in reference to each other. So I'm just going to slip this film in here, goes all the way, snaps kind of in place, uh, and then you pinch it. Let's see if you can see this. You pinch this closed. You have to do that uh, in order to get the cap on. And so you pinch it closed, and then you take the little corner, again, the corner part of the cap, put it over the corner, and then pull it in and snap it in place around the, the, the round back. That's the easiest way to do it. You could start the other way, but that's, that's the way I recommend. And that will snap in place. Once that's in place, you just pop it on there. And now both of our spools are feeding correctly. Feeds out there, goes around, feeds in the bottom, and it's going to go around like that. All right? OK. Once you've got that, it's a good idea to tighten, tighten this up so you don't have this extra loop of film, or not too much of that loop. In order to tighten it up, you can use a finger in here um, to wind it, or you can use a pencil eraser, or you can just kind of push the film in without feeding any more out. And the goal here is just to tighten up that loop. Once you've done that, you take the, this, the bottom plate, orient it this uh, this little piece goes in a hole, and and there are little pins to make sure that your cassettes are pointed down. And you have to put them down in order for the for these little pins to go over the edges of them. All right, and that basically tells you that if this once this fits on, everything's correct. Uh, once that's in place, you switch this. To the, to the white dot instead of the red dot. Now it means it's locked and your insert's ready. Then you just drop that insert into the back. Then you just drop that insert into your back, uh, the, the shell, and close this up. Push this down, push this in. It will lock. You have to press this button to unlock it and your film is loaded. At this point, uh, you will be on the S for start, and all you need to do is advance it, until it locks, and it will lock on frame number one. Before we look at individual cameras that this back can be mounted to, I'm going to show you one really extraordinary feature, and that is its vacuum capability. Notice this port at the bottom. It looks a little bit like a flash sync port. It's actually a vacuum port. This is a really unique feature of this back. What it does is allow you to create a vacuum seal anytime you think you need it or whenever you want to that pulls, that sucks your film into, uh, into a Pure, perfect flatness, well, at least fairly perfect flatness. Why would you want to do that? Uh, any film in any camera, especially small, small diameter spools like 120, when they sit for a while, right? If this sits for a while with the film strung around, ready to shoot, you're going to get some memory in the film. That bend in the film will still be there. And when you advance to your next frame, the, that bend will be in, a strain, in another strange place, right? Could be a little bit on the edge of your frame or something like that, causing a little buckle of the film. Most of the time, of course, those little, the curl in the film only has a small effect on your actual film flatness, and most people just don't worry about it. But if you are shooting at really, really, really wide apertures and you're shooting, you know, very, very narrow depth of field, it, could, it can matter. 
and or you're shooting a subject that needs to be incredibly uniform um, you know and in those cases maybe you don't want that that little bit of film curl <laughs> and it's funny because 70 millimeter film curls far less than 120 film because it's wound much in a much larger in a larger diameter um, it, it there's not as much strain on the film it's not as tightly wound so it simply doesn't have as much curl to it and it sits a lot flatter Remember, this is a professional system, unlike 120, uh, which was just designed as an amateur system. Th that's just not a concern. Film curl is not a concern for these amateur roll film, but for 70 millimeter, film flatness is really important. Obviously, it keeps your film flatter already, but, there, but Mamiya goes all the way, uh, you know, goes a little beyond, and also gives you this vacuum seal option. So if you do have film that's been sitting in your back for a while, from a couple hours to you know, days or weeks or months, um, then, you know, every time you advance after a film has been sitting for a while, your next frame is apt, is, is, uh, apt to curl an extra amount. And that's when you can use this vacuum seal. Now, what it is, is it's an actual bulb, a vacuum bulb. And this is not an original one. Um, the originals are made out of a material that deteriorates really easily, and most of them have not survived, and uh, they're really rare. Um, but Mercury Works makes a, an aftermarket vacuum system for this back. And what you can do, in either case, you just attach it, you just press fit it onto this little vacuum port. And this just, this can just hang off the back um, on your camera. And what you do is when you're ready to shoot a shot and you want it to be incredibly flat, right? You're really concerned about this shot. What you do is you just compress the bulb and let it go. And you'll notice that it stays compressed. It very, very slowly fills with air. As long as it's compressed like this on its own, as long as there's any indentation there, that means a vacuum has formed between, in, between the film and the pressure plate. The film is being held pulled by a vacuum into the pressure plate. So I, I won't show it to you. It's hard to, hard to really see that difference, but, um, but it's really remarkable. This works just as well for a 65 millimeter film as 70 millimeter film. As you can see, it'll hold its vacuum for quite a while, but it will slowly deflate, so it won't hold forever. Um, when you're ready, and this is important, once you, and now, now would be the time that you expose your shot. You shoot your shot, uh, while the film is ultra flat. And then what you need to do is you need to relieve the vacuum because you don't want your film pulled against the backing plate, or the pressure plate, when you advance. Um, they, they recommend you don't do that because you know, it could increase the friction or chances of scratching or whatever. So you take this little thumbstick and you press it in any direction you want. And when you do that, it just it lets air, it will allow the air to escape from the bulb and relieve the vacuum. And now you can advance your film. And again, you don't, you don't ever have to use the vacuum, but the, their recommendation, Mamiya's recommendation is if the film has been sitting in that position for a while, the very next, it's okay to shoot a shot that's been sitting a long time, but the very next shot after that one, is the one where you'll have extra curl um, and, that, and that you can use this vacuum. Now I want to stress again that this is not necessary for 70 millimeter film because it's 70 millimeter film. 70 millimeter, it, if only they had this for, I mean they do for some, but if only this were a ca the case for 120 film, 120 film curls like crazy and has this problem all over the place. 70 millimeter already vastly minimizes that problem, but this makes it even better yet uh, if you if you want to go that far. So that's just a cool feature. This is available from Mercury Works. Okay, so let's say you want to shoot this on the RB67 camera. This is the camera that this back was designed to be shot on. It's compatible with all versions, the Pro, the Pro S, and the Pro SD. And couldn't be more straightforward. This back just uh, loads on like any other back, right on the back of the, of the camera, and there's nothing to it. It's ready to shoot, and it, it operates just like any other 
120 or 220 back. It mounts to the standard back. You don't have to remove it. You don't have to remove this uh, like a Polaroid back or something like that. It just acts like a normal back. You can even have multiple of them with multiple uh, types of film loaded and swap them out anytime you want. Dark slide system, the interlock system, the double exposure prevention system on the on the later models, all works uh, perfectly. Technically, this is a Pro S back. This was created as a Pro in the Pro S uh, series, but it works fine on a Pro and it works great on a Pro SD. They never updated this back to a Pro SD. They just kept manufacturing this one. It's a masterpiece, honestly, of engineering. There was no need to update it in any way. Um, it works great on all those other ones. And in fact, this, they continued to make and sell this back all the way until they stopped making the RB67 and RZ67 cameras once phase one bought Mamiya and discontinued all film products. Uh, so basically this is this back was around for decades and decades and manufactured during that during that whole time. I will mention one small thing and that's the standard back will uh, works normally you have an additional option here on the Mercury back, besides a couple other features like place to write write your uh, write your film type and ISO and things like that. You can advance if you want. You advance to to the this little line to one of these lines, depending on what number frame you're on. Uh, you go to that particular line. Um, you can do that if you're shooting with centered, again, remember centered spools and not the offset spools. And if you're shooting with a centered spool, you're taking a little bit of chance on that frame wheel, but if it slips off that frame wheel, like you ever, it doesn't lock. As if, if you pull the lever forward and it doesn't lock, you can always just advance to the, whatever is the appropriate line for the frame where you are in the in the roll, and it will that's that's the proper advance for you. So it kind of works perfectly. You don't have to worry about the frame advance internally working perfectly, and that's why you can get away with doing a centered centered film, perfectly centered vertically. Um, if you don't, if you're using a stock back that doesn't have this option then of course you're dependent on the frame advance to be correct or you just or you don't won't know what you're doing and that's why you use the offset spool now when you're shooting with an offset spool this is what it looks like with the film in the camera as you can see one side has no perforations the other side does have perforations so that means that part of your image will be exposed over the perforations. Specifically in this case, as you can see, it's the bottom of the back that has the perforations. Uh, be, that will be the top of your frame because of the way optics works. So it's the very, so, so it's three millimeters and you're going to, three millimeters of the top of your frame are actually going to be perforations. So maybe you like that effect. You want those perforations in your image, um, fine. But if you don't, you're going to be cropping three millimeters from the top of your frame. That is the only downside to shooting 65 millimeter film is because of the position of these perforations um, and the size of the film, one, one line of perforations is going to basically uh, encroach into your image area. That's not really a big deal, you just mark your uh, the, the glass in your, in your finder or your back or whatever, uh, depending on the type of camera, you, you can easily just add a little mark to remind yourself that the top three, those top three millimeters are, are going to be perforation. Um, and if for really critical framing, you can frame a, a, appropriately. Um, but otherwise you can, you know, you can just keep that in mind. You know, don't, don't cut, don't cut your image. Don't cut something ultra close to the top of your frame, which you of course shouldn't do anyway. But that is the, the single limitation of 65 millimeter film. Be aware of that, but definitely not a big deal and a very small price to pay to shoot the absolute most amazing, professional, beautiful emulsions, the best film Kodak has ever made by far.
Okay, so what if you shoot with an RZ67 camera? The RZ67 is the later electronic version, basically, of the RB67. Completely different lenses, completely different backs, completely different mounting system. However, you can indeed shoot 65 millimeter film on it, just like anything else. So what you need though is a particular adapter and this adapter is called the RZ67G adapter and G means graph lock because the RB67 uses the graph lock 2.3 back mounting standard and that's what kind of back this is. The RZ uses its own uh, <laughs> you know proprietary back mount but this adapter adapts between the two so it's it's great all you need to do is the rz because it's an electronic camera it needs to know automatically based on the back the iso of your film that you have loaded in it so this has a little wheel um, very similar to actual rz67 backs uh, film backs um, you you just you you switch it to whatever your uh, your actual your actual ISO is and then you load the back on it and it hooks on the bottom there's no attachment at the bottom uh, just a hook so you hook it on the bottom and then you latch it on the top and it's good to go what you get on the back is is a standard RZ67 uh, ring mount uh, with the lock with it locks with this lever right and so you just pop this on the back of the camera lock it with this lever like you would a, a native RZ67 back and it's ready to shoot all right for the mini Mamiya press camera shooters out there you are in luck you can also shoot 65 millimeter on this camera using this same back. To do that, it only works on the, on the Mamiya Universal Press, not the earlier press cameras. It has to have this modular back mounting system. So it's only the Universal that, that you can do this with. But here's how it works. The standard camera comes with what is called an M adapter for Mamiya Press. Um, but anyway, uh, what you do is you just remove that that back adapter from the from the camera and you replace it with the Mamiya Press G adapter. Now they call this a G adapter and that sounds a lot like the RZ67 G adapter but they are different. <laughs> Very different adapters even though they they adapt to the same type of back which is Graflock 2.3 backs which is what we need to do in this case. Um, but this was a standard part. It's a G adapter and for the Mamiya Universal Press. So just make sure that it's the G adapter for the Universal Press and it just mounts right on there. Very simple. Once you, once you have that back on there, that, that back adapter, then you mount this, use the little sliders, the, the little graph lock sliders to uh, lock it in place and it works just like any other back. Uh, instead of the long S backs for the, the press, you have this, um, what actually amounts to a more compact back for 70 millimeter and in this case, 65 millimeter film. And this will work perfectly on the, on the Universal Press. Of course, the Universal Press is a up to six by nine camera, unlike the RB67 and RZ67, which in their, at least in their standard configurations are six, are six by seven cameras uh, that perfectly match the frame size here. The press can take up to six by nine. This back is for six by seven. So you will, you will of course have a slightly smaller frame than for instance, the viewfinder will show you. So you just need to know that your, that your frame is, has a little bit cropped on the left and the right um, when, you're sh when you're shooting with the, the universal press. Um, you can, just like shooting any other six by seven format with the with the press instead of six by nine. Okay, so again, one major advantage of many many advantages 
to 65 millimeter film over 120 is that you can cut the roll at any time you want. When you ready, you don't have to finish the roll because there isn't backing paper that you have to roll around something, um, and there's and you can't re you can't re spool uh, you can't continue to shoot if you were to cut a 120 film anyway. So it, it doesn't work in any way. You have to finish the roll. <laughs> it's so funny that photographers can get used to such an inconvenience. Um, in 70 millimeter and 65 millimeter shooting, whenever you want to develop, you can develop you, and keep shooting your, your roll in the meantime. Uh, you don't ever have to uh, finish the roll. In order to do that, all you have to do is this. Uh, once, you've, once you've shot your final shot, you are going to uh, advance um, not just another frame, but actually two frames. So you would advance twice and, and that to ensure that your the exposed frame is not just um, is all the way inside the cassette, right? Has been wound into the cassette, and I reckon you know if possible I would do this in darkness, but you don't have to do this in darkness. Either way, um, either in a changing bag or in subdued light, you just open this up, and remember you you can open this up. Uh, the only thing you're going to exp expose is the current bit of film that's that's right here. Uh, the rest of the film is still you know light tight and it's here or light tight here. Um, what you do in this case is you just you take a pair of scissors and again you can do this in the in the dark if you want to not lose anything. Um, in that case you can actually just advance one frame and and cut but if you advance two frames and cut you'll lose a little tiny bit of film here but you can do this in, in subdued light no problem. You just take the scissors and cut under here, maybe a little bit toward this side, which is the take up side. When you put the scissors in there, be careful not to press against to your backing plate, or your pressure plate, you don't want to scratch that, but you stick the scissors under the film, give it a cut, and now when you flip it over, you have your take up side, and uh, I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> your feed side and your take up side. So if you open this, you can just pop out your feed side, your take up side. And this is ready to send off to the lab in Alchemy or ready to develop yourself, etc. What I do recommend is that when you store this film uh, to be developed, you use a, a Mercury Works cassette uh, canister. So this is a MercuryWorks cassette canister, and it's specifically for storing these cassettes. And what you do is you just bend the film in the direction it's coming out, and you just pop it in there. And this uh, keeps your film, keeps out moisture, keeps uh, protects your can from impacts and dents, uh, obviously protects from light, uh, etc. Highly recommended uh, that you keep your film in one of these when it's, you know, and mark it as exposed. Um, you can put a little piece of tape on there or right on there. Uh, exposed and what it is, et cetera, um, and it's ready to go. What you can do once you've done that is you can just, you can keep shooting with this. This is still your take up side. You don't have to, you don't have to flip anything around. You just pull it through. Load it up, right? Pop that, pop that in a fresh cassette, and you can keep shooting while you send your film off or wait to develop it or, or whatever. That's all it takes to cut mid-roll. That is the beauty of 65 and 70 millimeter film. I hope this has been useful. You can purchase this film in 50 foot and 100 foot cans from Mercury Works. The link is in the description. Get out there and shoot some photographic IMAX photography.